Okay, we'll just wait a couple of minutes as people come in and then I think we will be ready to start. Okay, I think um, we will get going and then I'm sure people will join in. So hello everyone and welcome to this event hosted by Doctors in Distress called Reflective Spaces Nurses Care We Need Care Too. It's great to have you all here. My name is Susanna and I am Head of Programmes for Doctors in Distress. So as you will all know this is an event for any nurse, HCA, midwife, OT, physio or health visitor in the UK that has been working on the front line. So I wanted to explain a little bit about the practicalities of the programme before we start and I hand over to our wonderful speakers. So today you are in our opening webinar um, where we'll hear from a few um, nurses and our facilitators on their views on what's happened during the pandemic and what's going to happen in our groups um, and then after this we're going to run eight small facilitated groups so when you get into the group you'll be split into breakout rooms with no more than 12 people in your group and you'll be in the same group with the same facilitator each week and there you'll have space to talk about your experience of being on the front line to talk about what's happened over the past 18 months to process that and to share any anxieties or concerns that you may have. After these groups, we will have a final webinar where you can all come together to share your experiences of the group um, and to share any feedback with us. So in a short while, we will be hear hearing from our two facilitators, Viv and Fiona, about what to expect from our groups that start in two weeks time on the 3rd of November. Um, and these will run into the new year, finishing on the 12th of January. Alongside our facilitators today, you will see Brenda on our screen and we're delighted that she is joining us today and she's going to tell us a bit about her experiences and um, being on the front line as a nurse and a clinical director in South East London and what she has learnt um, through this period as well. And Brenda, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, unfortunately, Emma, who we had advertised as being part of our webinar today, um, isn't able to join us, um, but it's great to have everyone else here. So our email and website will be in the chat box. Please do ask any questions or comment if you have anything that you'd like to put to our speakers. We've got time to ask questions. Um, and for now, I'm going to pass over to our chair, Dame Claire Gerarda, who's going to tell us a little bit about Doctors in Distress and then speak with our facilitators, Viv and Fiona. Over to you, Claire. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And uh, thank you all for coming and thank you to our wonderful panel, our facilitators and, and Brenda. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're going to finish this webinar at 1.15, not the, the uh, time that we said, mainly because we've got a, uh, a, a, we've only got one speaker, so we felt that that would probably be appropriate. Uh, this it, we are recording this and this will go on to our YouTube channel and please if you've got any questions please put them in the in the chat box so yes doctors in distress despite its name it's not just doctors it's doctors nurses anybody in fact who gives more of themselves than they receive so anybody working in the healthcare system anybody working uh, in primary care secondary care the hospital sector and what we're aiming to do is to reduce the rate of suicide amongst healthcare professionals. And we're aiming to do this really through creating groups where people can come together to talk about the emotional impact of their work, to actually just talk about where they're at and what they're doing. Just sorry, one second. Apologies about that. There's a, a lot of noise downstairs. So really to talk about the emotional impact of their work. On the, the saying, a, a problem shared really is a problem halved. Of course, it's not going to uh, sort everybody's problems, but it may well uh, be able to give people a space to talk about that difficult day, that complaint you may have had, uh, somebody who shouted at you, the fact that you're feeling exhausted or burnt out. It is a space where we can actually talk in confidence uh, without worrying about what people think. And we've been running these groups now throughout the pandemic, and uh, I'm really hoping uh, from the feedback that actually we're having an effect. 
the group, the, the, this charity was established following the death of our founder, uh, Aman Dipsid, whose brother, who sadly was a, killed himself. Uh, he was a cardiologist and in, in, in the throes of, I think, being overworked, uh, burnt out, he sadly took his own life. And Aman Dip set up this charity, which I now run. So let me talk to our two facilitators, Viv and Fiona, who have been with us now for several months running several of these groups. And both of them are group therapists, group analysts who understand about groups. And I just might start with Fiona, really. Fiona, what is the power of a group? Just tell me, how, how do groups help? I think there's something about when people are able to come together um, and to meet and to know that they're not on their own with something. It is such a powerful thing. And just to be able to share how it's been together. Um, sometimes joining a group can feel it can be a bit of anxiety around it. But I think when you've got sort of similar health professions together, you've got a common language together that you can start to talk and to share with each other. Um, and this journey through the pandemic has, has been quite colossal, really. Um, and unfortunately, we're not through the other side yet. We've still got winter to come. And almost the exhaustion has become the new norm. And it is really helpful to just have a space, not to have to, to put a brave face on anything or just to try and to say how it is can also help to kind of sustain you and get you through something. And Fiona, I forgot to ask you, what, what's your background? Are you are you a therapist? Are you a, tell me tell me what your, your professional background is, Fiona. Um, so I started off as a general nurse. Um, I trained in Northern Ireland and then I went to Scotland and became a midwife. Um, and then I did a counselling psychology degree and I became a psychotherapist working doing CBT in IAPT, which is Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. And I'm a group analyst and I work in a psychotherapy service. And I've been doing a lot of um, staff support within the NHS and mental health. Um, helping the staff in a system that's pretty broken at the moment and there's lots of sickness and lots of really difficult challenges on a day-to-day -day basis so I've been quite busy. And so thank you for helping us keep us all together as well and Vivian what would people expect to happen in a group in a therapy in one of the groups that we run because they're not strictly speaking therapy but they run along therapeutic lines aren't they? Yes, I suppose um, they're more classed as support groups, but support can be very therapeutic so that um, the importance of coming together in a space that is confidential enables people to talk more openly about things that concern them, whether it's about um, their everyday work life or how their everyday work life might be impacting and very much so now on their personal lives. Um, it, it may not be psychotherapy, but it can be very effective in helping somebody cope better with their day to day lives, whether it's work or personal. And is what's said confidential, Vivian? I mean, to talk a little bit about if people express, I mean, let's say worst case scenario, they say something about their trust, uh, which they don't want to get out. How can they guarantee that, that this is confidential? I suppose we can only guarantee that it's confidential in that we advise and guide that it is and that it is down to each person in the group to know that everybody's in the same boat. So to, to think that you can say something outside of the group um, and that some, someone else can't, I think that gives you a sense of cohesion where people trust that their what they say will be respected. But of course, it's okay to say your own personal experience about being in the group. I might go away and say, oh, I had a group today and it really made me feel this and this and this about myself. So long as it doesn't include or name someone else, then, then that's fine. It's about not divulging what another person is experiencing because that's very personal um, and actually isn't confidential. And Fiona, you talked a little bit about what the, the enormous strain and stresses that NHS staff have been up against, and I suspect you yourself in trying to support us. Do you think that having 
a space, I mean, it's a sort of rhetorical question, but having a space just to take a deep breath and just to talk about what we've been through, do you think that really can help? Well, I think the conversation sometimes, especially for staff who've been on the front line, what you have all seen and what you've had to manage has been really, really difficult. And I know, Claire, you've talked about moral injury, and I think that's one of the biggest dilemmas that people are having to, to face and to talk about because the circumstances were unprecedented um, of what the running out of resources and not having enough ventilators and having to manage the loss and death was colossal as well, let alone having to manage what was going on in your families and whether your own families were affected. And also the change in, in working environment where especially when the, the schools had closed and that you know the children were at home as well. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, but also having to keep going at the minute, there may not necessarily have been a space to stop and to talk about it. Um, so, you know, these spaces are really, really important. And we're going to hear from Brenda in a little while, but the people who will be joining uh, these groups are actually healthcare staff who have been working. So we've run groups for those who've been on furlough or, or who've been shielding or have been on sick leave or those with long COVID. But these are for those who have continued working. And I suspect that what a lot of them will talk about, and maybe Brenda can pick some of this up when I talk to her, is I think many people are now numb, numb to, to what they've been feeling the last 18 months, numb to the pain they've been experiencing, numb to the losses and to the grief. But I suppose, Vivian, it's important not to be numb. It's important to be able to open up again. I mean, is that something that the group can help with? I think the group can certainly help with finding a way to speak about it. They may not be able to do it straight away and some may not be able to do it through all the eight weeks, but hearing what other people are saying and sharing. And it's part of my role to support people to open up and talk about whatever they think affects them. And in that context, the group actually enables people to hear what other people say about their difficulties and maybe identify with them. I mean, one of the things to say about me is that for the last four years, I've been working in CAMS as a psychotherapist and most CAMS services did continue working face to face with young people. And that put a lot of pressure on staff and a lot of the staff got COVID. Um, and were affected by the experience of not only having to be an essential worker, but be ill at the same time. And to be able to find somewhere to talk about how frightening that can have been for them, and yet wanting to continue to work with some of the most vulnerable kids, it, it was uh, an opportunity that was not offered to many of them to have a space to talk. So I think to have this space is, is going to be great to be able to explore whatever comes to mind about what bothers you through this time. And our experience from running the other groups is how valuable they've been for people to be able to just talk. Uh, I mean, even once I've got your mic open, think we, we try and put people in the same space, the same group each time. I'm assuming, again, maybe slightly rhetorical, but assuming it does help to have some familiarity with the people in your group to be able to open up if you can see somebody. Absolutely. I mean, what we've done in the past is we've kept the first three sessions open so that people can join because sometimes they just can't make it um, at, at the time that it starts and they might be ill or they might have a commitment with work. But after the first three sessions, the next five are closed. And that means that you can come together as a group and be more open with the same people and that I as facilitator can help guide people because I get to know them and they get to know each other and they can challenge each other or question or give ideas to each other in a way that if someone new keeps coming in it, it may just change the dynamic a bit. Yes and, and Fiona have you found I mean you presumably pre-pandemic like the rest of us run face-to-face real-time groups do you find much difference remotely I know we've all sort of got slight zoom fatigue but is it difficult to open up if, if we're just a square on a on a screen what I've actually find is that um, <clears throat> people can actually be much more relaxed when they're in their own homes because you can have a cup of tea you can have a glass of water 
What sometimes can be slightly more difficult is if there are other family members around. So we just ask that people um, wear headphones um, and if somebody else comes into view that they just switch the camera off or if they need to go and answer the doorbell. So I think people have found it um, quite helpful. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult if people um, don't have a good Wi-Fi connection, um, but we're always quite happy just to stop and wait for that connection to pick up and then we can repeat something if it's, if it's been missed. But I do think emotionally we're able to, to make connections with feelings as well. But I think it's also quite helpful just after a session, maybe just to go out for a little walk and just to get a breath of fresh air. So then, and then just to break that kind of transition, because usually yes. when we meet face to face, you've got that travel time that helps to kind of give you a bit of processing space. And all, all of these groups will be virtual. Doctors in Distress will hopefully start resuming. I say resuming, we've never actually run face to face group because we started in the midst of the pandemic but hopefully we'll be starting to run groups because i mean i'm going to leave this to both of you really maybe starting with you fiona as you the last but the power of we go back to the way we started the power of connections the power of people the power of belonging to something is cannot be underestimated and we've lost that a little bit during the pandemic with through social distancing and but in your experience, groups help rebuild those connections. Is that right? Is there anything you'd like to say just to sort of finish uh, in this section? And then I'll come over to you, Viv, and then uh, start talking to Brenda. I think certainly what remote um, sessions help is that people can access it from, from a much wider area geographically. Um, but there is something that we're all having to get used to, kind of coming back together and seeing people from the below the neck and realize oh yeah I've put on a lot of weight you couldn't see that when you could just see my face <laughs> so yeah I think it's, it's good both ways really yes let's not put the weight issue into maybe we can all discuss that in our groups before I come to you it, it may well be worth mentioning that if you can't attend one week it's not a problem we can you can fit in and pick up where you left off the, in the week before. But what's your sense, Vivian? What's your final words around groups? You're such an experienced group therapist. Uh, you come from Scotland, isn't that right? Are you actually in Scotland at the moment? I'm in Scotland, but I worked in London for 20 years yes. in the NHS in London. But, but do you understand the pressures just like Fiona does? So what's, what's your last thoughts about these groups that you've been running for us? Well, I think it's really important. Uh, of course, people can miss sessions, but I think it can be disruptive if you're always having to miss a session or come in late. So I would advise if you can get there because it makes all the difference to attend each one regularly. And it may not be easy to speak, but even if you just sort of say, I'm finding it hard to speak, that somehow connects us um, with the rest of the group. And, and everyone can support you then. Um, and, and I just know from over the years, I, I wouldn't do this work if I didn't think it, it made a difference. I've been a group analyst for 10 years now, running groups in the NHS. And I do see a difference that it can make because each person supports each other, not just the therapist. It's about mm. individuals caring about each other and giving each other the support. What, what a lovely way of ending this session. And I'd like to thank Fiona and Vivian because you've really helped us, Doctors in Distress. You've helped us just to learn more about the power of groups, but also to provide stability to us by having the same facilitators for different groups, but familiar faces. And we're learning together. So thank you both very, very much. Brenda, I'm going to come across to you now. And of course, you're a fellow South London uh, nurse uh, I think we've come across each other many times in the past and do you want to just say a little bit about what you do at the moment and, and then we'll I'll just ask you a few questions. Okay hi everyone um, thank you for having me here I'm uh, Brenda Donnelly and again another person from Northern Ireland and came here and I've worked as a nurse in general practice and just until recently was an education leader across South London but my main role at the moment is a clinical director for a primary care network in South Southwark PCN. So that's my that's my main role. If you, I mean, I can expand a little bit on that uh, if you wish. 
So basically, you've been working throughout the pandemic and you've uh, we had a sort of little pre-meet beforehand. You, I suspect, like most people listening to this and listening to this on YouTube, have just given your all for your patients. And how have you kept yourself mentally well? What I mean, you know, just say okay. as much as you can. Okay. If I can just go back to the 11th and 12th of March in 2020, or whenever, we were so excited. I had just become a nurse CD. This is the first time nurse The CD is clin clinical director. Clinical director. So it's a very, you know, kind of an unusual post for a nurse, certainly. But, you know, it's open up to anyone. But as a nurse CD, we were able to represent this at the CNO summit. That's the chief nursing officer summit. Sorry to you if you're a paramedic or one of the other allied healthcare professionals. But actually, this is as important to you as well. So we went there full of glee and thinking we're going to be able to represent primary care. And I left there with such a fear and such raised expectations. It was the 12th of the country hadn't shut down. Nothing had happened. But I left Birmingham thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So I arrived back in London and thought, oh my God, this, people don't know what's happening. You know, people don't know what's happening. And with this great expectations and an urgency to have to do something about it. And obviously as a clinical director for the network, for this area of 330,000 people, we needed to make sure we were doing something. So, I mean, I think I was overwhelmed right then, but I think as what my opening of that was from in 1820, Florence Nightingale came to be and what she said then was that this was her 200th year and we were celebrating this. And what, what my comfort was at the beginning, look, things like this happen all the time. People will find it within themselves to do something. And so in that sort of vein, it was, it was about sanitation and it was about cross-infection. It was stuff that nurses know. And I thought, well, if anybody can do this, a nurse can do it. So let's see what we can do. And then put my face in and said, we need to do something. We need to do something. And being that insistent person, I think part of that is like, you know, how you cope with stuff. You say, I'll do something. If I'm doing, it will work. Something will happen. So it was that kind of fear and the raised expectations. I think, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? But I think, like you were saying, Claire, we connect, we link out to other people. And so there were a couple of other clinical directors. And I thought, guys, we've got to do something. Let's do something. You know, we just can't sit and wait and something happen. We need to do something. And, and that was my kind of first uh, whole thing around the pandemic. So we were um, involved in setting up the COVID clinic in South London, where we brought in black cabs and we were seeing patients there. And I remember seeing... You know, here I am, I'm much older than most of my colleagues. And I saw these people who were really scared, these young GPs, and we formed these teams really quickly. And they were almost afraid to go out and see patients. And then I had another lovely Scottish guy, another GP, who actually got me involved in this as well, Gavin. And, and you know, I think it was, are we so lax at this? Are we so behind? We just thought, OK, well, let's just go out here and see these. And thankfully, the first patient that I'd seen, obviously, Claire, I'd been around a long time, done various roles within the community. And there was an elderly lady and I went out and I recognised her and I thought, oh, hello, how are you? And one of my other colleagues then said to me, God, Brenda, you just were yourself. These people aren't different. They're all right. They're OK. We're going to be all right. And I think, you know, that gave me great sort of, I thought, oh, I just I just said that. I mean, I was frightened. Of course I was frightened. I was frightened for myself as well. So, so. Brenda, if we could have, if we could have uh, bottled you and bottled your enthusiasms, your, your love, your compassion, uh, your leadership, I think we would have been in a much better position. It sounds that you were an abs. It sounds, and this is said in a in a way. It sounds like you went into nurse mode, and by nurse mode, I mean that, that compassionate, caring, where we all know that if we think of the nurse, that's what we think. And but you describe being frightened. You describe uh, seeing people around you who are frightened and you're older therefore you must have very early on have realized you were more at risk than the younger ones in terms of death from Covid but is it just something that was inside you that was able to, to just go forth and do what was you know that the Florence Nightingale put yourself at risk I mean it sounds like I'm used to use that awful word 
you have enormous resilience of which I have seen amongst so many nurses. I mean, does that come from an internal strength or have you learnt it or? I, you know, I think it's a bit of a combination, Claire. I think you learn that along the way. You learn to put the, the patient first. And so when you're not really sure, I mean, from many, many years ago, you know, being a nurse in charge of a, of a 60 bed at ward, a third year student thinking, oh my God, what do I know? But you do know. So you dig deep to yourself and find what is it that's in within me and, and having that kind of if I can't manage, I'll go and ask someone else, but actually I can't. And there was an expectation of us, I think, to manage stuff. And that's the bit where I think that we are not so good to ourselves because we actually then don't really listen to our own needs. And I think it's only over years that you start to think, actually, what do I need to, to feed myself in order to be able to do this? And I you know, almost think it's you know, sometimes coming up for yourself, actually, we're not accepting this anymore. Is this a woman's role? You just, you know, it's almost like an, uh, an adaptation of that. You just get on and do with it. You're not necessarily trained to do it, but you just get on and do it. So, so therefore it's that. But I think, you know, to be honest, there is definitely some professionalism here. Nurses are amazing professionals. And so they do what they're supposed to do and what they've been taught to do. And I, you know, we'll get. But they're through. often they're often uh, not as lauded as, for example, doctors. Uh, often it's you know, the doctors. I mean, I talk about doctors a lot and doctors' high rate of suicide. But we know that nurses have even higher rate of suicide, uh, and yet uh, we don't attend to nurses as well as we attend to doctors. We don't, and nurses have far less control over their working environment. You have much longer, sh you have much more compact shifts where you, you, you're really are stuck physically and metaphorically in a single space. Primary care nurses are quite isolated because there tends only to be one of you rather than you know, maybe five or six GPs. So how have you kept your enthusiasm and your mental well-being going over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years that you've worked you seem so enthusiastic you, you you i mean you know i suspect there are days when you don't feel like you but how have you kept yourself going um i, I think from the people that i work with my call i think and first of all actually i think look it's the patients out there it's the patients that keep it they're the continuity and then through that through that willingness to or wanting to get other people to be involved in this and i think there's such a real important thing of being part of a team and a multidisciplinary team. And as you know, I think I've always been, and I love this idea of the groups you see, because I've always been involved in getting nurses as groups together to grow ourselves, to actually push those boundaries, to actually not stay in that sort of role where you're being told what to do. There's no reason why we, we have to be, I have never done it. And I know there are loads of nurses like me or other healthcare professionals, you know, pharmacists right now who, who want to strike out and be these other people who work and decide what our population need rather than just doctors deciding what it is. I mean, if we look, if I look at population health, I think that was Florence Nightingale. That's what she was doing. You know, no, no different from, from what we're doing today. But Claire, I think- I've And, and, and Edith, Edith, Edith Cavell, no, you haven't gone off, please. What you've talked about is a sense of, of autonomy, a sense of belonging, uh, and a, a sense of competence. So you've actually identified the three main factors that predict protect our mental health and if we're going into the sense of belonging you've also mentioned groups and belonging to something so tell me a little bit then about how you would see these groups that we're going to put on for nurses how you would see them helping because nurses are busy people we've particularly targeted nurses who are working uh, it's a lot for them to come in essentially in their own time uh, how do you see these groups to help would help them I think I think one of the things is raising awareness for ourselves that we actually need help ourselves mm -hmm. rather than actually just being I think when things are sent out there, I think we have to recognize our own vulnerability in this and we have to recognize that we need to be nurtured as well. I think we're too busy sometimes giving and doing rather than thinking what do we need for ourselves. And I think it depends on the areas where you're employed, whether you're actually enabled, that is enabled to happen. So I think it's been given the space and time to make it to make mm -hmm. it happen is for me would be really important. And that's about employment structures and organizations and getting time out. Because sometimes, you know, we just don't want to make the time out to do it because it, it 
and it's finding why do I not want to do that because it's just too hard sometimes to look at that real issue that's causing you problems and I think that's where group therapy really helps because you've got so many other people there who can be soundboarding and you know I run a, a clinical supervision group which is you know for the NMC have already mandated this for nurses but very rarely does it happen but in my area we I run I'm a supervisor for the social prescribing link workers and it's just amazing what they achieve from it and I, I would love to see something like this for our social prescribing link workers, the pharmacists and the nurses and the GPs within their own little community they're in. So um, that's that's where I would see um, that's the thing. And Brenda, we're singing from the same hymn sheet. What I would love to see is every single health professional, every health professional having access to a confidential space where they can talk about the emotional impact of their work and I have a formula which is nine times a year for 90 minutes which seems not an unreasonable amount of time uh, if you think about uh, the sort of work we do the hours that we put in and of course it's not a, a magic it's, it's not going to as I said it's not going to sort everybody's problems but it may well normalize some of those terrible things that we take home with us the, the complaints that we've had the as I said somebody might have just been off that day or you might have been off you might have just shouted at somebody you didn't mean to but that's what happened or, yeah, 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 and just yeah. to normalize it and actually to to talk about it to learn together uh and not to uh not, not to be distressed I'm impressed that the NMC have now made it mandatory I must say I've not seen it in action I've not met a single nurse that's it's gone to supervision groups so maybe off, off uh, we can actually talk about that and see how we can get the NMC to hold for. So coming back to you then Brenda, coming back to you and your capacity to stay mentally well, thinking about the nurses listening to this, can you give them some advice as how you have kept professionally mentally well throughout your career but in particular during the pandemic? Okay, so I don't have any children, and I think children are a great um, thing, but what I have are what I call pseudo maternity leaves. So through my professional career, I've taken a year and a half or a year off to do something different. So I've done garden design, court culture, and things like that. And I think during the, the pandemic, and I, I love cycling, and so during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time in the allotment with my fingers in the dirt, because it was the only way to actually feel I'm away from this. And it was beautiful weather. And it was just amazing to put seeds in the ground. I didn't care if I ever ate any of them at the end of the day, but it was somewhere where I could 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 just switch off completely. And it was, I think, in the beginning, being on the bike, I loved being on the bike because by the time I got to the COVID clinic and then home, I could make some space. But I also have, a, you know, I think a really good partner and a really good group of friends that I connected with. But, you know, it was all virtual, uh, but some of it was virtual. But most of it was, you know, my partner and the people in the allotment keeping distance. But having that time to talk was was really, really good for me. And I like music. So listening to music was something as well. And, and I had again, I had I don't know if you've ever heard of Shiny Mind. So it's an app. It was a, we were um, giving some um, um, space with as being nurse CDs because we were very unusual. I think to put it into context, there was 1,200 CDs across the country and there were 16 nurses who became CDs. And there was a recognition that we would never, you know, we would never really stand up and talk against all of those doctors. So they were giving us some special space to actually, how do we develop ourselves? How do we have this, how do we get a voice? And the show, the Shiny Mind is run by a psychotherapist called Beck. I can't, I can't remember the Beck's second name now, but it is an amazing app that she has. And in that is these kind of little bits where you can do mindfulness and you can do different sort of things that help you remember your own gratitudes. What am I grateful for today? How can I do this? What will I do? And, and I think that was a start. I wasn't very good at doing it every day, but I certainly tip, dip, tipped into that to make myself be okay. But I think my, my thing was my colleagues. I think it was my, my colleagues and being able to say to them, oh my God, I, I was so stressed out at one stage. I thought I had chest pain. I thought, oh my God, I must be getting it. You know, I'm not getting a heart attack. I called the GP and the GP said, you better go to a &E. I said, I can't go to a and &E. I'm going to work. I had set up the vaccination clinic by this stage. 
And it was, you know, that was the real positive thing having coming out of the COVID. I think that's what kept me sane and good because I found all of the goodness of other people coming together to volunteer to set up the vaccination service was really, really good. So, so your, your, your answer is, is find, <clears throat> find some space for yourself, yeah. irrespective. Make sure you, you use that space, see the good in others as well as the good in yourself. And to be grateful for some of the things that uh, that we all have, we all have things that we can be grateful. What wonderful advice! Can I bring in the two facilitators for the last bit? So, Fiona Riverview, you've heard Brenda talking about groups for nurses, sense of belonging. Maybe if I start with Fiona, only because you're on my left hand side. Is there anything there you'd like to pick up from Brenda as sort of final thoughts or, or just a comment? You know, you don't have to pick up what Brenda says, but amazing interview, an amazing person. I'm so honoured that she's a, a local nurse in our area. I think in the, in the groups that I've done before, which was with um, sadly nurses who had long COVID, they absolutely just love being together and coming from different areas of work. And just being able to share actually sometimes what their organisations were doing, but also starting to keep in touch with each other. And we often set up WhatsApp groups so that people can then um, support each other after, after that. So friendships also develop um, from this coming together. But nurses just, I think, love being together. And nurses have it. It is it's amazing that we have to reinvent that no man is an island entirely to themselves. Uh, that actually we need to have a sense of belonging but yes I mean nurses in particular I think it's because of their job that they have to come together and the, the pandemic of course has driven them apart uh, but I think in particular that they are right. Vivian what about you what are your last thoughts on, on wonderful interview or anything that you'd like to bring up? Well I was just thinking Brenda when you said you're one of the few non-medical clinical directors. I have a very close friend who was a non-medical clinical director for five years and it nearly destroyed him um, because he couldn't get the support that you described uh, with nurse colleagues you do get. Um, and maybe even with medical colleagues you might get, he was neither of those. Um, um, but also it just reminded me of um, my first days when I worked at Bart's uh, as a psychotherapist many years ago, um, but I worked in HIV and AIDS and we would work in the tea room, sit in the tea room with the nurses. And it just used to be, because we, in those days, lots of patients were dying from AIDS and we would share in the tea room um, how, how we were feeling. And most of the nurses would be able to just go and just flop and talk. And that tea room was taken away from us we fought and fought and fought to have that tea room kept, but with the changes at Bart's, they took the tea room away and it took that group space away. So we felt a bit disconnected. Um, so I think it's really important that groups of people, well, clinicians of whatever kind come together. And I think that my survival through the pandemic has been my way of connecting with other psychotherapists through Zoom and my dogs who had nine puppies <laughs> in lockdown and so I understand about and, and that was another group I had I had another small group at home <laughs> and it was wonderful so you did send me a dog though I, I'm sorry my dog normally is here but uh, she seems to have disappeared <laughs> well how wonderful and so just to tie all of these ends those that listening to this we will be starting the group work very shortly. Susanna will tell us when, I think it's next week. You'll be put into groups, which will be your groups with Vivian or Rachel. The space will be there for you. Hopefully you can even badge it as your supervision if the NMC of, uh, unless Brenda's telling me that there's different criteria, standards and evidence you have to present, but they will be spaces where you can actually talk about your work, not particular patients, but. The, the general issues but whatever you want to talk about we will be running them online sadly rather than face to face but hopefully uh, as time progresses we'll be starting to run them face to face and they are under the banner of the covid health uh, care support appeal which is was set up right at the start of the pandemic by the royal college of nurses in order to support nurses and others during these difficult times 
So I'd like to thank Brenda, I'd like to thank Fiona and Vivian, and I'm going to hand you over now to Susanna just to tie up some of the, the details and to tell you where you can receive information. Yeah, thank you everyone. And I think it's just been such a brilliant discussion um, with such amazing advice and insight and wisdom. So thank you to all of you and thank you, Claire, as well. Um, so our groups will start on Wednesday, the 3rd of November. So that's two weeks time on Wednesday. Um, and you will receive an email from us with the Zoom links um, and the information. Please do let your colleagues know about these groups. Um, I think if there's anyone that you think will have missed um, our advertisement or have missed our social media posts, please do let as many people know as possible. I think um, sometimes people will hear about the groups and want to sign up but haven't had the opportunity to find out more. So please do point them our way. Um, and brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are going to end there, Claire, unless you have anything else. No, that's it. Thank you very much to everybody. Brilliant. Thank and, you. And uh, have a nice half term, those of you that are having half term next week. If not, uh, please try and get a break. Please try and get a, a, a space for yourself, if only to put your hands in dirt <laughs> and to plant a seed. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.